worship together. Let us be called to worship. We come here today not because we are clever, because, but because God welcomes the slow learners. We come here not because we are wise, but because God loves us in the sight of our God. We come knowing that the greatest persons will be found among those who humbly serve like Jesus did. And that the brightest ideas and the deepest truth will come from those who see themselves as little children in Christ's school. O oh Lord, open our mind and our hearts and enable our lives to declare your praise. I invite you to stay and join us in our opening hymn. I sing the almighty power of God. Sing with us. to be in our lives. 
We have two scriptures we're going to read today. The first is James chapter 3, verses 1 through 12. And if you have your phone or your Bible in somewhere, and your social, kind of, your phone or your iPad, or, or maybe you even brought your Bible. Oh, I see some actual Bibles. That's awesome. James chapter 3, 1 through 12. Not many of you should become teachers, my brothers and sisters, for you know that we who teach will be judged with greater strictness. For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes is speaking perfectly, able to keep the whole body in check with a problem. If we put bits into the mouths of horses to make them obey us, we guide their whole bodies. Or look to ships, though we, they are so large that it takes strong winds to drive them, yet they are guided by a very small rudder, wherever the will of the pilot directs. So also the tongue is a small member, yet it boasts of great exploits. How great is a forest is set ablaze by a small fire. And the tongue is a fire. The tongue is placed among our members as a whole of iniquity. It stains the whole body, yet on fire the cycle of nature in itself, set on fire by hell. For every species of beast and bird, of reptile and sea creature, can be tamed, and has been tamed by the human species, but no one can tame the tongue, a restless evil full of deadly poison. With it we bless the Lord and Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. Does a spring pour forth from the same opening both fresh and brackish water? Can a fig tree, my brothers and sisters, yield olives or a grapevine figs? No more can salt water yield fresh. And our second scripture comes from chapter 8 in Mark. Verses 27 and 28. Jesus went on with his disciples to the villages of Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked his disciples, Who do you say that I am? And he answered, John the Baptist, and others Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. He asked them, But who do you say I am? And Peter answered him, You are the Messiah. May God bless the reading of God's word. Thanks be to God. I love the taste of shoe leather and tennis shoe leather and sandal leather. Right? Maybe we all do at times. It tastes like humility, maybe. Yes, shoe leather is certainly an acquired taste, as I'm sure I don't have to tell you. And you may be asking, why are you putting all these things in your mouth? But what I think that many of us have unfortunately acquired over the years, for many of us, including myself, we have spent the better part of our lives with our foot planted squarely in our mouths. As it turns out, foot and mouth disorder actually may be a real psychological disorder. I'm sure you came to church thinking, I really want to be told that I have a psychological disorder. <laughs> According to the American Psychological Society, there may be a mental explanation for our inappropriate social gaps. The journal Psychological Science reports, the dinner party guest who puts his or her foot in his or her mouth could lack a crucial mental ability that stops the rest of us from blurting out our true feelings. The article speaks of a certain inhibitory ability that keeps some people's feet planted firmly on the ground while the lack of that ability leads to improper statements. It seems that many of us have lost our inner mob block and simply speak that which is on our mind. So you have an out, right? When you say something inappropriate. 
before you can just say, I have a psychological disorder. <laughs> <laughs> the book of James seems to know that we have this problem, admonishing us that not many of us should be teachers. In verses 3, 2, he writes, For all of us make many mistakes. Anyone who makes no mistakes in speaking is perfect. How many of us are perfect? I didn't raise my hand. I don't think I raised my hand. I'm just doing it as an example. Able to keep the whole body in check with a bridle. And the bridle, James mentions, just might be an, an inhibitory ability that keeps us in check, keeps our thoughts to ourselves. Now, with the rise of social media, how are we doing with that? James offers wonderful imagery of a horse guided or girded with its bridle, a ship guided by its rudder, and large objects moved at the will of something much smaller. And he writes of a great force, started by a small spark, imagery that is intended to show us just how damaging our little bitty tongue that is in our mouth can be if we lose our ability to keep it in check. So, I've come up with a solution to this. We are going to create a cloistered community within our church where no one speaks. Everybody up for that? <laughs> well, we look at Mark, and Peter is a prime example of foot and mouth disorder. Perhaps that is why so many of us can relate to the brash, impulsive nature of Peter, whose swashbuckling ways often get him into more trouble than he ever bargained for. We read of him whipping out a sword to protect Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane. He steps out in the water in faith. He even makes a few careful steps but sinks and yet another impulse a few, mo few moments later. And here he is in our scripture that we read today, and a little bit further in that scripture. He quickly responds to Jesus' questions about who he is. And he says, you are the Messiah. An answer that may have been so passionate, Jesus knew he had to put a muzzle on his disciple. Like an excited puppy, Peter was always ready to go. Unfortunately, it was another outburst a few verses later that Peter in deep water gets Peter in deep water once again. When Jesus tells those gathers that he would face death and undergo great suffering, Peter pulls his leader aside and actually begins to rebuke Jesus. We don't have Peter's words, but it's not difficult to guess, maybe what he might have said, like, Jesus, we've got your back. You don't have to suffer. We'll, we'll, we'll storm in there. We'll create an army. Or maybe, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You will ride in Jerusalem victorious. Don't talk about suffering. You'll scare all the people away. <laughs> Peter should have held his tongue. And in response to Peter's actions and words, Jesus turns to the other disciples and publicly lashes Peter, saying, Get behind me, Satan. For you are setting your mind not on divine things, but on human things. Peter had missed the point again, and Jesus made an example out of him. So what do we do with Jesus calling Peter the rock on which Christ would build his church? And what do we do with Jesus' harsh rebuking of one of his favorite disciples, maybe one who would have known Jesus the best, could help us in this understanding. Now, as I said before, biblical historians have long believed that the Epistle of James, the author of the Epistle of James, was none other than James, the brother of Jesus, an influential figure in the early church following Jesus' death. James would have been as close to Jesus as anyone. And like his brother, James seemed to understand what the mouth can do. Maybe we do too, especially in the 
this time. Just as we see Peter at once lifting up Jesus as the Messiah, the Christ, and then rebuking him for living into that prophecy, James points out that all too often we have a tendency to speak out of both ends of our mouth. He writes in 3 9, with the tongue we bless the Lord the Father, and with it we curse those who are made in the likeness of God. Ouch! <laughs> James points out that the tongue is one of the few things in all of creation, in everything that's been created, that cannot be tamed. By nature, he seems to say, our tongues lead us into bad situations. How many times has your tongue led you into bad situations? There are times that I wish, even on a Sunday morning, I could have taken back everything I said. <laughs> if we cannot tame our tongues, what then should we do to prevent these bad situations, these foot-in-mouth moments? So let us look a bit closer at Jesus' response to Peter. After rebuking Peter, Jesus calls a crowd together and begins to teach them. He says something that would have knocked them off their seats. And if we are truly paying attention, it may do the same to us. He tells them, if any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. That's a profound statement. If we want to follow Jesus, we must put ourselves on the line and be willing to follow Christ even to death. Now, let's just use social media as an example. Does that mean every single solitary thing <coughs> I think about everything in the entire world needs to go on social media? If I am following Jesus, am I putting myself first? Or am I putting Jesus first? Jesus. Take up the cross is what we are supposed to do. Our words are supposed to mean something. All too often we trivialize this phrase, take up the cross, with statements like, that's just my cross to bear, or in reference to some of the negative things in our lives. And sometimes that just might be true. But what would it look like if we had to choose life and denying Jesus and death and following Christ. What if Jesus told us, if you say these words, you are denying me? What if someone said, if you comment on that person's post one more time, <laughs> you are not following me? What if it if at work, when I am so angry, all I want to do is lash out at every single person I see. What if Jesus said, you are denying me in that moment? There's a group, an organization in Oklahoma called Voices of the Martyrs. And it lists those around the world who are in prison or face death because of their faith. And their website tells of a pastor in China who was sentenced to death for illegal religious activity, for following a great commission to make disciples. He faced severe beatings on a regular basis and was only one of dozens listed on this site. Three men in Indonesia who were in prison for allowing children to attend a Sunday school class program. For following Christ's call to let the little children come. In Sudan, Christians were sold into slavery for proclaiming Jesus as Lord. Throughout Central Asia, Christians were expelled from their country, imprisoned, and put to death for practicing their faith. This is what Christ meant when he said, If any of you want to become my followers, let them deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. For those who want to save their life will lose it, and those who lose their life for my sake and for the sake of the gospel will save it. 
The immediate example of this are those listening to Jesus or his disciples. Of 11 who followed Jesus after his death, 10 were put to death, often cruelly in their work, in their work of spreading the gospel. They were beheaded and crucified and tortured to death in various ways. So what does all this say to us? Why is Mark and James being put together on this Sunday? Why does this make a difference? Spreading the gospel, using our words, makes has a cost. Whatever we do with our tongue has a cost. And we can have positive costs or negative costs. Are we using our tongue for the right reason? Are we using our tongue in the costly part of faith? Are we using our tongue simply to lash out at others and using it for ourselves? When we go to places, when we speak to people, when we use our words, is every word we use meant to bring about disciples of Christ? Is every word that we use bringing about peace to the world? Is all every word we use identifying us as Christ's givers and receivers and deliverers of the good news? Are we choosing faith when we use this powerful tool of our tongue? the last thing you put on social media or the last thing that you said to someone? Did you say anything about Christ in that sentence? Or your faith? In his powerful book, The Cost of Discipleship, Bonhoeffer speaks of cheap grace and costly grace. And this is what he says. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without Jesus Christ, living in the current. Costly grace is the grace which must be sought again and again. Such grace is costly because it calls us to follow, and it is grace because it calls us to follow Jesus Christ. It costly because it costs a man his life, and it's grace because it gives a man the only true life. Following Christ for Bonhoeffer took his life. He died because he was a disciple, a follower of Jesus Christ. We fortunately can say and do things within our country that we will not be put to death for. So we can use our tongue in more powerful ways in this country than in others. And do we do it? Does the life we live in here speak out there? Do we use our tongues for the good news of Christ? It's a daily sacrifice to use our tongues in good ways. And it may have consequences, but we're already paying consequences for the things we say, right? <laughs> so, so what's the difference? Our tongues are meant for God's purpose. And following Christ means that our tongues are the most powerful things we have to use in that service to God. So, when you go out of this service today, may we all think about how we use our tongues what we're sharing in the world and how are we impacting those who need to hear about Christ. And maybe you'll go right home and put something on Facebook because I said that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but that's just, that's great. Continue to do so. Because there's lots of things in this world that we're speaking 
that is definitely contrary to the way we should be speaking if we're Christ's disciples. It might cost us everything, but it will cost us things that maybe weren't that important to begin with. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. May we affirm our faith, the faith we claim, this faith that hopefully will guide our tongues. Let us say um, the statement of faith of the Creed and Methodist Church. These are different statements of faith that are in our United Methodist Hymnal. And each month we'll select a different one. And they're all statements of our faith as United Methodists. We believe in one God, creator, and sustainer of all things. Father of all nations, the source of all goodness and beauty, all truth and love. We believe in Jesus Christ, God manifest in the flesh, our teacher, example, and redeemer, the Savior of the world. We believe in the Holy Spirit, God present with us for guidance, for comfort, and for strength. We believe in the forgiveness of sins, in the life of love and prayer, and grace equal to every need. We believe in the Word of God, containing in the Old and New Testaments, as a sufficient rule of the faith and practice. We believe in the Church, those who are united in the living Lord for the purpose of worship and service. We believe in the reign of God as the divine will realized in human society and in the family of God. For all of our brothers and sisters, we will believe in the final triumph of righteousness and the life of our last. Amen. Well, with our tongues, we want to share the good news, and with our time, we want to do the same thing. We want to make, we want to thank God for all that God is doing for us and through this church. Um, we have great and wonderful people and volunteers that are doing good things and are using the gifts that God has given them within this world. So thank you for each and every gift of talent, of the gift of our offering, and all that you give to United us and United Methodist Church.
with patience, with love, with kindness, taming our tongue. 